Okay, folks, welcome to our pricing panel called The Price is Right tonight. Um, I'm Betsy Hodge from St. Lawrence County Cooperative Extension and co-hosting with me tonight is Lauren Olson. She's part of our local foods group. Would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. Hi, I'm Lauren Olson. I do marketing and development for producers and some consumer awareness in St. Lawrence County. She's also doing a very large program called the Ag and Food Producers Academy. Would you like to tell people about that? Yeah, so today is actually the last day to sign up um, and we're doing a multi-week, multi-track Ag and Food Producers Academy uh, surrounding business and marketing skills. So we're gonna do a, like a business and finance course. There's an e-commerce, social media, then a value added track. Um, and I'm gonna put the link in the chat, but tonight is actually the last chance to sign up. And our opening session is this Saturday, which will be online. And the other courses are all online on weeknights. So it's pretty, pretty accessible to folks and I'm happy to answer any questions too. If you wanna message me or I can provide my email too, so. Great, thanks, Lauren. And, and that program, what is the grant that helped fund this? Yeah, it's a USDA grant, a farmer's market a promotion program. And then we also got funds, actually funds for this, <laughs> this panel tonight for speakers through the Workforce Development Institute. So we're, we're glad to, to get the funding for this program. Yes, uh, Flip and Lauren approached me and said, what can we do for livestock? Let's do a livestock panel. And I said, I think we should do pricing because I constantly see farmers, in my opinion, are underpricing themselves. And so or underpricing their products, I should say. So I thought it'd be a good chance to have some people that are out there doing it on a larger scale, talk about how they do it. Um, I'm just going to run a couple little polls here. I am the livestock educator, by the way, and I do have sheep of my own, and I do freezer trade and mostly the auction and freezer trade. We find the polls. This is just to tell us a little bit um, if everybody will just fill these out. There's two questions, and um, we can sort of get you have to scroll down to get the second one. If you click on this, you should that'll sort of tell us. The people that are on here, whether they're meat or dairy or fiber or produce. We got a little of everything here. I gotta scroll down and find the second one myself. Wow, well, interesting. Okay, last call for the poll. Thank you everybody for taking a minute to fill that out. It just helps us get an idea and I assume the speakers could probably see that as well for who's on here. I'm gonna end the poll. Oh, you guys can't, can you see the results or not? Oh, they're there. There. I was watching them come in. Sorry, I didn't realize everybody couldn't see them. Oh, we got a mix, mix in both. Great. Okay, I'm gonna stop sharing the poll. And close that for now. And um, well, I'm going to let each of the speakers introduce themselves, and then I'm going to ask some specific questions and call on people to answer those. I'll try to give each speaker a chance to answer each question. So we'll see how we do for timing. So uh, Shannon, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself? And everybody else, if you'd stay muted and like send your questions in through the chat to Lauren, that would be a big help. Hi, everybody. Can y'all hear me now? Yes. All right. I'm Shannon Hayes from Sapbush Hollow Farm. We are a diversified grass-based livestock farm, um, and I run it with three generations of my family. We are in Schoharie County, New York. Um, we also have a farm-to-table cafe. 
We market most of our products now um, through a um, an honor store and an online website, sapbushfarmstore.com. And um, I think I'm here tonight because I, I um, recently had a book come out, Redefining Rich, um, where I talked extensively about pricing and pricing psychology and yeah. dealing with the emotional aspects of that um, and ran a three-part series on a podcast that I do called the Hearth of Sapbush Hollow podcast. So um, I've been doing this uh, since, um, well, I grew up on Sapbush Hollow Farm, but I've been at the helm of the business since 2017. I've been working in the business with my family for several decades now. Great. Thanks, Shannon. Uh, before we go to Sean, I just want to mention that all three of these people have really nice websites, so I encourage everybody on the uh, on this webinar to take a look at those, you know, tonight or tomorrow. And they have sort of mouthwatering pictures of good food. Besides, just hard when you're looking at them at work and you're you keep popping up to this beautiful piece of cheesecake. I think that might have been on Sarah's. <laughs> it's like torturing me. Uh, Sean, why don't you tell us about your farm? Sure. Uh, I'm Sean Youngman of uh, Youngman Farms in Wayne County, uh, Wolcott specifically. Uh, my dad and I <clears throat> uh, run the farm together. Um, been doing it for well all my life and dad grew up on the farm and my grandparents had it before that. Um, we raise uh, beef, uh, about 200 head or so with, with uh, about 70 brood cows. Um, and we market everything uh, through our own channels locally um, and through our website. Thanks, Sean. How about you, Sarah? Hi, uh, I'm Sarah Van Orden Marl. I am um, partner, owner, operator, cheesemaker um, uh, at Swimmers Farm and Creamery, and we are in Seneca County, uh, right in the heart of the Finger Lakes. Um, I grew up uh, in the Hudson Valley on my family's farm and then uh, ended up coming to the Finger Lakes and starting my own farm from scratch. Uh, so kind of a, have both perspectives from a multi-generational farm and then a, a first generation farm also. Um, we are now, a, I would say a diversified grass-based livestock farm also. Um, but started out as a pretty traditional small dairy farm and uh, have diversified in the last 10 years. Um, we milk brown Swiss cows and have currently, we've been making cheese for the last 10 years um, and then added beef and pork uh, and eggs on top of that, uh, which is all direct marketed at this point um, through... Uh, online sales on our website. Uh, we have a CSA. We uh, attend the Ithaca Farmers Market, which is our largest retail outlet. Um, and then we also wholesale to some extent. Um, and we are it, in the midst of uh, purchasing another farm property, which will give us our own dairy processing space. And uh, we'll be adding fluid milk and yogurt and gelato to our product line um, in the next week or so. We were hoping that that would have already happened, but things are going slower than expected as usual. So um, yeah, we're, we're kind of in a crazy place at the moment, but a good one. Well, thank you for joining us. And you can tell us about pricing those new products when we get to that. Yeah, that's just making me dying to ask you all guys more about all your farm and how you run it and how you do all those things and farm at the same time. So it's really exciting. Um, I'm going to jump right into the pricing questions. The first one is very basic. Uh, how did you come up with your prices originally? So you've got these products, you know, did you compare to the grocery store? Was it based on your cost of production or what do you think the market will bear? Um, I'm going to call on Sean to go first on this one. Well, uh, we kind of, uh, we started out doing just freezer trade, uh, halves and quarters. Um, and we kind of went off market, uh, what market, you know, the commodity market was going. And then we added a premium to that. Um, I sort of, uh, 
you know, cost of production was sort of an afterthought. We never, never really thought about it at first. And I think that's usually how it goes probably when you're first starting out with something like that. We used to milk cows before that. And, um, you know, so the milk check just came in the mail and we didn't have to worry about, you know, our own pricing, but, uh, yeah, we, we started with the, the freezer trade, um, and kind of adjusted our pricing based on, uh, the market, our local market with, uh, other farms in the area. Um, we kind of went off that and then, uh, what the butcher shop was charging for, for, um, processing. Um, and then, yeah, I went from there with the individual cuts we added later on, um, and kind of use our, our freezer trade price as a base price, um, for that. Mm -hmm. And how do your prices compare to like the grocery store? Uh, well now, uh, I've heard that we're actually a little cheaper <laughs> on some things, <laughs> um, as, as a lot of people know, prices have gone, gone crazy lately. Um, but most of the time we're, we're higher, but you know, you can get that with, with, uh, you know, your label and, and being local and, um, you know, whether, whether it's grass fed or, or dry aged, um, pasture raised, you know, people like to see the farm behind, you know, their food and, uh, but yeah, yeah. Right Good. now we're, I probably should adjust my prices a little bit. Um, yeah, I, I, had some people come in lately and the big M, which is a local grocery store in Wolcott, and uh they said, Oh, your your prices are actually less than the big M. And so <laughs> maybe it's time to increase a little. Yeah. 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 Well, that's good. So you're so you can adjust your prices though. That's good. Yeah. And it's it's uh easier to adjust your prices on a, a cut that sells easily versus you know like top round steak or something that you have a hard time selling anyways um mm -hmm. but uh you kind of adjust as you go i guess so sarah how did you originally set your prices when you started out and maybe how you adjusted them i'm very much a numbers person so um spreadsheet calculating costs of production um we valued our milk from the beginning at a price that we thought was high enough to cover our costs and earn a profit the way that we wanted to farm. Um, we didn't use the the commercial market value for milk. I've kind of thrown that out the window. And at this point, people ask me sometimes like, oh, what are milk prices doing? And I don't even pay attention anymore um, because it doesn't impact us anymore. Um, but I, um, had an opportunity last winter to take a class, um, and came across a workbook, um, put together in Vermont that is kind of set up as a whole farm plan. And, uh, you can put all of your enterprises into it and separate out all of your, um, costs and your prices and, um, what percentage of your products are marketed through different channels like it can get very involved and I spent a lot of time last winter um, working on those numbers and kind of working towards a goal for the whole farm um, for profit and then working backwards from that like this is the amount of money that we want to generate for ourselves and how do we put all the pieces together to get there and there's a lot of pieces uh, which makes it tricky because you could you know, you could raise the price on one product or one enterprise even for us and offset the price of a different product. Um, so it, it's kind of a, it's always a work in progress of putting all those pieces together to figure out where we are as a whole farm. Cause that's ultimately our goal is to be profitable as a, a whole farm business. Um, and it's easy to kind of get stuck in the details of every individual cut, but at the same time, mm -hmm. every individual, you know, every indiv individual product is important too. Um, so I'm going to send people yeah. that uh, spreadsheet that you shared with me earlier today. It's kind of like an account book on the spreadsheet plus, 
plus <laughs> plus some things to yeah. calculate with. So it's really nice. So, but what do you do when you have a value added product that must change your, your pricing a little? You're not charging just the milk price if you have cheese or something like sure. that. Sure. Um, so, so we're using a formula to say, um, like for cheese, this is how many pounds of milk go into that pound of cheese. Um, these are the other ingredients. This is our costs of production. For us, it's been rent up to this point for processing. Um, labor. Um, so we get to a kind of a cost of goods sold for that product, which is all of the variable costs that go into it. And then there has to be some overhead uh, associated to, with it. Um, and then which the overhead would include things like marketing, um, our, our operations are for our farm, um, things like insurance, taxes, um, and then once we have a, a total cost for the product, then adding a profit percentage, a margin on top of that. That's good. I'm glad to hear you're putting your labor in there. Seems like a lot of people forget actually, that part. I mean, that's a that's a been a big question mark for me, especially this year as labor prices just keep going up. Um, whether you know what are you valuing your labor at? And it's important, I think, to at least value it at some kind of reasonable market dollar. Um, it was probably you know, like both my husband and I could go out and get jobs and make way more per hour than what we are, mm -hmm. but we are at least valuing ourselves at a price that we could hire someone to do what we're doing for. Good for you and still can sell your product. That's excellent. Shannon, how about you? How did you, you, know, you guys have been doing this a long time, but you must base your prices on something. You're, um, Shannon, you're muted. My apologies. Um, I would say a lot of what Sarah and Sean talked about, um, we look at the labor um, and the cost of feed and the cost of processing and the transportation. And then we do get into the squishy factors of what the market will bear. Um, and also, um, you know, when we were doing farmers markets, I put a 20% premium on every farm price <clears throat> um, because I had to handle it and drive it and sit there with it at the farmer's market. Um, and so I'll also look at, um, you know, just the cost of yeah, handling the product and the marketing. Um, and then once I do all that, I come up with a retail price. And then um, I work, um, there's another question I have to ask myself, which is how hard am I gonna have to work to sell it? Sean tapped into that with those pesky top round steaks or the London broils. Um, that's a, a constant issue that you, you identify a retail price that you need for your product. And then you know that no one's gonna pay that <laughs> and they don't value it. And so um, part of that is then, well, how, you know, what do I have to do to move, to move this stuff? And I can always sell all my ribeyes and my porterhouses but what do I have to do to keep those other cuts moving? So that obviously has to come into the balance as well. It's not just what I need. So I try to look at a whole animal approach and then how hard I'm gonna to have to work to sell certain cuts. And then um, another thing that does go into the pricing for me is how motivated of a seller am I? Um, <laughs> there are certain products that I'm really happy when they don't sell. <laughs> and part of my income on the farm is what I eat. Um, so right now I have a surplus of pork shoulder roasts and I should probably be marking them down and trying to move them. But the fact of the matter is um, I love pork shoulder roasts for dinner. I love pork shoulder roasts for breakfast and I'm just not motivated to put that <laughs> on sale. So that does go into the equation. So there are hard factors and then there's the squishy factors. Interesting. Thank you. Um... And uh, you've both, uh, actually, you've all alluded to this a little bit. Uh, do you adjust your pricing for any of these things, like the farmer's market location? Because I know I have found that 
I, some farmers markets can bear a much higher price than uh, other ones and or volume discount to get people to purchase more or I don't know if any of you are involved in wholesale selling like to a store I think Sean you sell some meat to a mm. actually to a business that they sell again or maybe your distance to the market so Sean what are some of the things that you adjust your prices for um yeah definitely wholesale um and when you set your I guess initial retail prices you have to have your wholesale pricing in mind um you know you can't start off too low and then want to sell to a store or something and have to mark it down and then you're not making any money but um most of what we do are like whole animals to uh butcher shops um but uh we used to sell at farmers markets and we for the most part keep the price at least of the cuts the same just because somebody can jump on our website in Pennsylvania and see what our prices are. Mm -hmm. And um, so if you, we found if you change your price for the market, um, you know, Oh, I saw your price on the website. It was, you know, $2 <laughs> less. And ah, so um, people are paying attention. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. But uh, in like distance um, we do some deliveries uh, and I'll just put in, like a delivery fee instead of adjusting the price, um, you know, to, to make up for that extra distance you have to go. Um, but uh, yeah, and, and definitely marking down, um, like if somebody wants 50 pounds of hamburger, they get, you know, a better price than if they're just coming in for one pound. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, same with, you know, we do like freezer bundles and it's about 10% or so less than if they were to buy each cut separately. Um, but yeah, we, for the most part, keep the prices the same for the, the cuts at least. Um, and for our wholesale markets, it, it kind of depends on what your customer is willing to pay a lot of times. What so, do you think, do, what do they mark up on your wholesale cuts? I know I sold some stuff to a local cooperative and they would almost, take half again as much like if i sold them six dollars a pound lamb they would charge nine or ten for it okay well most of what we do uh like the butcher shop will buy a whole animal and then they cut it uh, okay um, so i'm not sure what their what the actual markup would be um like for one store that we sell in uh we do it by like a uh, a commission sort of deal we own the meat still and everything and then i i bill for what gets taken out of the freezer um and that's 15 percent um i guess what they get for for the trouble um mm -hmm. but I, I don't know what the you know we we don't usually sell you know like a, uh, to a yeah. restaurant and then yeah interesting how about you uh, sarah do you adjust your prices for different things um we do sell wholesale um, mostly cheese, um, although some of our beef and pork is marketed that way too. Um, for the cheese, our, it's about a 25% uh, difference between our retail and our wholesale prices. And I would say most of those, the buyers are marking that up higher than that, um, which I'm okay with because that gives people an incentive to do business with us directly, directly. still. Um, we do send some products into New York City and uh, we definitely are able to charge higher prices on that product. Um, we have a, a, the same thing as Sean said, um, are running into this challenge where we want people to pre-order for pickup at market through our website. Uh, so we haven't changed prices that much um, between, and. We're also um, in our transition here, we'll be having an on-farm store, which we haven't really had oh. up to this point. Like uh, people would pick, people would place orders and come pick up at our farm, um, but we didn't have a fully functioning storefront and we will have that now. So I feel like our overhead for the store is probably going to pretty closely equal out to our overhead for going to the farmer's market, um, but we'll see, time will tell. Um, so I think we're going to keep prices pretty consistent. Mm -hmm. 
Good. How about you, Shannon? We do have. Go ahead, Sarah, finish up. I, I was going to add, we do have bundle options um, as far as volume. Um, if people are buying larger quantities, like a whole wheel of cheese, they're going to get a better price. Um, and we do cut different package sizes, like four ounce and eight ounce. And the four ounce price per ounce is higher than the eight ounce piece, just mm -hmm. because of the extra packaging and time to cut those smaller pieces. Thank you. Shannon, don't forget to unmute. I need you to tell me what the question was. I'm <laughs> so into listening to people's answers and I was answering the question on the chat too. Yeah, yeah, so I'll, and I'll bring that up in a minute also. Mm -hmm. um, do, you, do you adjust your pricing for any of things like the farmer's market location? Like do some markets really bear a higher price than others or yeah. do you do volume discounting, wholesale pricing? I remember you... visiting your farmers, one of your farmer's markets up in St. Lawrence County <laughs> several years ago when I was agog at how cheap everything was up there. I didn't know how anyone could afford to make it. Um, yeah, I was at uh, a, a farmer's market for 20 years um, and we charged quite a premium. Like I said, we put 20% on top. Um, and um, I came to the conclusion that our business could actually do better just leaving the farmer's market entirely um, and, and going direct from the farm. So in the past uh, last year we finally left it actually because even though it looked like we were generating a lot of money um, even with the premiums that we were charging having someone off the farm all day um, tearing the family apart and having people sit down there um, selling the, the premium just wasn't covering the cost and we were only driving 45 minutes in no traffic mm -hmm. to a farmer's market but when I started crunching those numbers I was pretty sure that as much as and it was a high volume market it was a very high volume market and boy when i pulled out let me tell you it's like don't let the door hit you on the way back because people really wanted that position but when i was crunching those numbers um i just didn't feel that the farm could what could swing it it just looked like it because it looked like a heavy cash flow because it was moving so much product was moving but um i really didn't feel that the actual f profitability was there I think so, in our yeah, in I our... do think you have to carefully when you go to a farmer's market and you leave for the day and you're off farm and no one's there when the pigs get out or you're hiring <laughs> someone to stand with your product, um, you gotta be so careful about your pricing. I think in our area, uh, some of the farmers go to a bunch of different farmers markets over the week. And some farmers markets are in a relatively poor area and some are in what we call like the touristy area. And you can actually charge quite a bit more per cut in the uh, per pound in the touristy areas, and they don't even blink. You know, you're feeling guilty for charging so much, and they think they're getting a good deal. So, I know that does happen around here that there's some adjustment of prices. Now, Flip did ask a question back a little ways here. Yeah, I can read it, Betsy. Sure, that would be great. And we'll uh, let Shannon go first. This time. Yeah, Shannon uh, answered it a little bit, okay. but uh, Flip asked, how does how has your ratio of wholesale to direct changed over the years in business? So have you have you altered your wholesale or direct market uh, selling for your products? Um, and Shannon, you you answered a little bit. I can read what you wrote here and you can add on anything. Uh, you said COVID has had a big impact on your wholesale and retail ratio. We almost entirely retail with small CSA business, but the processing shortage last year led to accelerating the development of your CSA program. You've increased by 100% in the last 18 months, and you consider the CSA program a hybrid of wholesale and retail, and you don't you try not to have too many traditional wholesale accounts. Do you want to add anything else to that, Shannon? Okay. How about you, Sarah? What, how has your ratio changed? Or has it? Um, COVID had a big impact on our business as well. Uh, we lost most of our wholesale cheese 
market um, mm -hmm. because that was going to restaurants and caterers. Um, and we've seen some of, I mean, some of that has recovered, uh, but we're not 100% back to where we were. Um, we shifted our business uh, from being largely cheese sales, um, the beef and pork just exploded and we've grown that as aggressively as we can in the last 18 months. Um, and our CSA, we had just started our meat CSA prior to COVID. Uh, the timing was great and that exploded too. Uh, so we are really fortunate that we were in a place where we could capitalize on that demand and run with it. Do you have anything to add to that, Sean? Uh, sure. Um, our most of what we do is wholesale, and it's it's been wholesale. Um, and it sort of, I guess, COVID did help a lot. Um, our wholesale sort of uh, shifted around quite a bit. One of our shops had shut down for um, a few weeks, and and uh, but luckily another place that we hadn't been selling very much to picked up kind of the slack. So that helped out a lot. And our, our re like direct to customer, um, the end consumer, uh, actually went up quite a bit this year or last year. Um, we, we opened our own little farm stand or farm store, um, here on the farm. Cause we were doing, uh, like pre-order kind of stuff. And then people come to the house and pick it up. Um, but uh it got to be more busy and and uh so we've been doing our retail has has uh increased and we were able to open a little farm stand and and uh yeah it's it's been a, quite a ride the last couple of years uh, big demand we were discussing that before the meeting of is there now was there a, like a glut last year and do you think that people's freezers were full and maybe didn't buy as much this fall or or not I think, I think um, the whole scare with the big plants shutting down, um, people were terrified that you know the food was going to run out in the store. So they came to the realization that there's oh there's local farmers we can get food from, and so you know we got kind of inundated. And then most everybody I think just kind of went back to the grocery store and traditionally the way they were buying things. And but quite a few people stayed you know come back uh you know became repeat customers so good that's what i wondered is you know yeah. or if people just bought so much that it was hard to but they're still eating it <laughs> yeah <laughs> okay i have another question for you guys there's another one in the chat but i think we'll wait a few minutes on that one um do you, any of you use claims like grass-fed natural animal welfare approved or uh, dry, I heard you say dry aged earlier, Sean. Are yeah. any of those, do you think those help sell your product? Uh, definitely. Um, we are uh, GAP certified. Um, so we can actually put that on our label. Do um, consumers know what that means? Uh, not the average consumer, it's more for um, uh, like the, the butcher shops like to see that and, um, certain, uh, like Pineland farms, all natural, yeah. um, we sell to them and that was a requirement for them was to be gap certified. Um, it's most farms do most of the practices to be gap certified. Anyways, you just have to pay, um, you know, pay to be certified and they kind of go through your records and everything, but, uh, it definitely can add value um you know whether it's grass-fed or um all natural um you know pasture raised there's lots of lots of terms out there that's for sure so sarah do you think people are looking for those labels i would say our customers are looking for the 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 practices um they're not necessarily looking for the label uh, in our situation where we're, we're actually having direct contact with the customers and can educate them. Most of them just want to know what, how you're farming. Um, 
they are not concerned whether you have a certification or not, in my experience. Mm -hmm. um, in some situations, like in a, if a farm was going more towards wholesale where their product is going to just be on a shelf, then having being able to put those labels on your packaging probably would be more valuable in that situation. But for us, we we haven't felt the need to do that. Um, I would say few of the of our customers are looking for certification. They're interested though. But in we're also not animals. certified, so those are not the customers we're finding either. Yeah. <laughs> I guess well, if, you know, if those those are if there are people that are looking for certification, they're not shopping with us. Right. Or maybe they feel comfortable because they can talk to you directly and know how your animals yeah. are treated. So Shannon, how about you? Do you use any claims or do you think that that's uh, something people are looking for? Uh, we talk to them about our practices all the time and we use those terms, but we do not do any labels. Um, we, like Sarah, uh, because we're direct marketing and you know we have a, a reputation in the community, um, that kind of precedes what we do. And um, people can find out, they can look on the website and we explain our practices. So um, all those certifications to me, you know, as the person who's in charge of the bookkeeping and the record keeping, I just don't want to deal with more <laughs> of that. Um, so I'm not very motivated and um, have not felt like that's hurt the business in any way. Well, my, my next question was about consumer education. And it sounds like most of you are doing the consumer education so that you don't have to go through all the, the uh, hoops and things to be have a certified sticker on your label of some kind. Right. Um, and most of the people that come, you know, like, um, you know, that come to the farm to buy a steak or whatever, they have no idea what gap certified is. You know, they, um, you know, they want to know, you know, how the cows are raised and, and where you graze them and all that kind of stuff. But yeah. Do you, what do you think their biggest concern is? Um, in our area, price is, is up there the uh, pretty high. Um, but, uh, you know, they like that they're on pasture most of the year and, um, you know, that they can see the animals. Our farm store is, is you know, out in our front yard kind of, and the cows are basically right behind it. And, um, you know, they can see the animals when they come, come by. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah. How about you, Sarah? What do you think people are most concerned about that you educate them about? We have a wide range of customers. Um, some of them are definitely looking for organic practices and grass-fed, um, more regenerative practices has become a buzzword in the last year. Um, I don't always think that customers understand what they're asking for, but they're, these are terms that they're hearing yeah. and they think they should ask for it. Um, we actually have surveyed our CSA members about things that are important to them. And one of the comments that I got back was that the, the animals are ethically raised. Um, and they also do find it value, you know, important that they're supporting a small local business. Um, they, mm -hmm. They understand the impact of keeping their dollars in the community. Okay, Shannon, how about at your place? What do you find people are interested in knowing about your farm and your how you raise your animals? Um, so if they're coming to Sapbush Hollow, they're they're totally about social responsibility. Sounds so dour, doesn't it? Um, <laughs> They're, well, it sounds like it's a job and that they're fulfilling a negative job, but they're actually looking for connection. They're looking to connect with the land. They're looking to connect with neighbors. They're looking to connect with, with us. Um, and, and that is, you know, that, that product is, is the meeting point. So, um, yes, price is definitely a concern, but um they're it's beyond social responsibility they're building a different world when they come out they're not doing something because they have to check a box 
um, because if they have to check a box, then they're going to go and they'll get their their socially responsible stuff off the grocery store shelves. That's checking the box. If they're driving up the hill to Sapwish Hollow Farm, they're coming because they believe in what we do and they want to be a part of that. And they want to support that. That's good. They want to do more than support that. I mean, it's 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 a it's a depth where they they want to be in that web of um knowing others and connecting with others and uh, but you know maybe that's because i i have the honor store the farm store but there's this cafe there that's sort of like this community hub so they're coming in they're getting their eggs they're getting their meats but um they're stopping and they're talking and they're grabbing a cup of coffee and they're finding out who can help them repair their roof and they're finding out who might need some help so there's a whole community um event that, that's happening around it and we try to keep building that because um, our our goal for the business isn't necessarily just to sell pork chops, it's to nourish and restore family, community, and planet. And they're they're just into that, and they're working with us on that. So it's collaboration. But I think yeah, when they're when they're choosing to come to Sapwish Hollow, they're really choosing to participate in that whole experience. Mm -hmm. I know uh, my farm is everybody's when their grandkids are there, that's everybody walks to my farm and comes in and looks at the animals. They know they're welcome to pet the cat and talk to the big dogs. And I never realized what an attraction it was until I was out there one day when they were all piling in and out over Christmas. It was uh, pretty nice to see and nice that they felt welcome and uh, they come and take pictures with the animals. They do all kinds of silly things. But it's great. Uh, we have some other questions in the chat, but I I want to ask you at least one more pricing question and, and encourage the audience to type in questions in the chat for us. Um, how do you keep track of inventory? I mean, one of the things that's very challenging is you know you got all this meat in the freezer or cheese in the fridge, and you go, if you go to a farmer's market or you fill up your CSA baskets, and then you well, especially the farmer's market is bad because then you come home and you put stuff back and you. You need to, how do you know what you got? Shannon, go ahead. You're smiling. I think you relate to the problem. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I just finished my year-end inventory. I keep Yay. these spreadsheets, these worksheets on my computer. I print them off. Um, and uh, I have, I use Square point of sale system, which is a free uh. point of sale software. Um and I know some people use barn to door or some other programs where they can, they put in the actual weights um, because I have a system that is tied to uh, the cafe and mm -hmm. online web sales. I do, I don't do fractional pricing. I do units in quarter pound increments. So every time an animal comes back to the farm that's been processed, um, I log it in, in a weight category. Um, it seemed really tedious at first, but now, you know, it's just, I, I don't know if you can see, it's just a matter of little hash marks all over the place. Mm -hmm. And then I sit down at my computer and it's a couple minute job to go into my square system and say, okay, I've got, you know, I've got uh, 10 ribeyes that just came in, in the one to 1.25 pound category. I've got, you know, so many packages of ground beef and I do those as just single units. Um, roasts, I have, you know, weight categories. Maybe it's the best system, maybe it's not, but um, I do keep it up because to keep those online sales reliable, I've got to do it. So then what happens is I have an honor store and I have price prices on every product in the honor store. When people log out of the honor store, that means it's 24 seven, they can go in at any time. Um, they leave me, um, uh, they write an invoice for themselves and they leave it in the box with their payment. I sit down once a week and I um, enter that in basically as an invoice to the honor store. And then I record payment. And then that takes everything that they bought that week out of the system so that that inventory mm -hmm. stays up to date. Now I do have um, a, 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 a local um, store that uses our product and they get invoiced through this too. And then I just slap a discount on. So they get a bunch of product. Um, they get charged, their bill shows the uh, full retail price and then it shows their wholesale discount, which is a 20% discount. 
And the only problem I have is that when that store, they like to pay their invoices once a month. So that inventory will lag behind. So I, you know, will have a little bit of a squishy factor um, where I have to sometimes reach out to customers and say, actually, <laughs> that product oh that the website is showing is in stock is not in stock. So, but yes, uh, I've had to learn with COVID, I had to become a real stickler about inventory. It all used to be right up here. It's not anymore. How about, can people pay with a credit card in your honor store? Yes, uh, okay, they can do. Um, so what they do, if they want to pay by, they can do Venmo. So we have a little Venmo square oh. thing where they can shoot it with their phone. They can do checks, cash, or they write bill me and leave me an email address. And then I send them a credit card um, an invoice through Square where they can just pay on their computer at home. Oh, cool. So lots of options. Shannon, we have a, Go ahead, uh, we had a question about your honor store from, from Amy. Um, how's the success of the honor store been? And do you find that most people are honest uh, when, sh when shopping there? Um, so a I do have a camera out there. Um, I don't look at it. Now y'all know. Um, I we put it out there so that if we had to, if we felt there there was an issue, um, but the question about are people honest goes back to what we're trying to do. So my farm store is at um, you know up in the hills. You have to drive these long twisty roads to get it um, out of the village, and if somebody has to go in there and take food without paying, um, then we are of the belief, again, our mission is to nourish and restore family and community and planet. If they're there to steal food, <laughs> um, then they must need food. Um, there has always been more cash in the box than the receipts add up to. Um, so I noticed that people, like they might, you know, round up and just leave extra money. Um, sometimes I think they don't report things correctly. So there's not perfect reporting, but I have not had an issue with um, product. The only thing that's ever been lost so far with the honor store is somebody um, took a chicken, left their weight and said, bill me and never left a name or an address. <laughs> Oops. Um, but at this point, no, but am I fastidiously watching no, because again, it gets back to asking for us, what are we in business about? And if they need to take a dozen eggs and they can't leave five bucks for the dozen eggs, um, then th that's what, you know, we're trying to make it all work as a whole. And so I could spend a lot of time sitting over that Google cam and studying everybody's behaviors. But that camera is really only there if, you know, there's vandalism, if something really happens that we're very concerned about. Um, so maybe maybe people are stealing chapsticks. I don't know, <laughs> but um, I, I don't think so. Most of the people know what we're about when they go in there. Thanks. Uh, Sarah, how about you? What is your inventory method? And do you, did you say you have a store now, an actual store store where people can pick up products? We will going okay. forward. Yeah, that's part of our transition to this new um, property. Uh, up to this point, we've had an honor stand also that's been self-serve. Um, we have not had a problem with it. Um, uh, as far as inventory, I use Square um, point of sale and I will uh, give Matt LaRue the credit because uh, he talked me into doing his research project this year and running all my sales through Square, which I wasn't doing before. Um, I was, it was all paper, it was all recorded, but there was a lot of manual data entry after the fact. Um, so now I'm kind of I've been on a mission for the last month to try and find a, a better web platform um, because sort of a mess, but I couldn't have a Square store because I had a Weebly store, which was Square before, before it existed before Square connected to Weebly. So I essentially had to start over in Square um, and now I can have a Square store. So I'm working on setting that up 
and uh, that will help my inventory management immensely because everything will be going through the same platform. So it's essentially going to look a lot like what Shannon is doing. Do you folks have a webmaster or are you doing these web pages yourselves? Sarah? Myself. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, same, same here. I had somebody do the initial design uh, with me, but I, since then I've been tweaking everything myself and changing things. And what do you do for inventory, Sean? Uh, I'm not very good at it. Um, our, uh, you know, by the cut selling is still a fairly small part of our business. Um, but like with the the farm store in Webster that we we have a freezer in, I'll check that every every week or every couple of weeks. Um, I have a running list of what's in there, and then just kind of check off what's missing, and then build build a store that way. Um, but as far as in our own farm store, I kind of it's sort of still up here. Um, I have a basic knowledge of what's in the freezer, but um, yeah, we don't keep a running inventory of what's in our farm stand yet, so. I was um, curious on whether any of you ship, actually like in the mail or FedEx, ship meat anywhere? I guess any of you can take that. I... Uh, we haven't tried that yet. I've, we've been asked quite a bit um, and I've looked into it. it just the, the cost of it was, uh, was pretty high for you know what people wanted so mm -hmm. Shannon have you tried that there she is sorry I'm having a hard time with my mute button today um yes we do have a shipping program and what we have learned it's it's very limited um because we're small um, you have to negotiate your rates with UPS and we're too small to negotiate for very competitive rates. So those big companies that really throw a lot into just shipping can just outcompete us hands down. But where we do have a, a pretty sustainable competitive advantage is the fact that um, where we're located, we are in the same zone as the New York City metropolitan area and a good portion of New England. So we have a very high population that is close to us. Um, I don't know if it's the same in St. Lawrence County, or if you just out of that zone or not, but I can ship UPS ground one day. So I can actually do the shipping car charges are about $30 for a one cubic foot box, $25 or so, but then I've got $15 of dry ice that go into the box. Mm -hmm. So I can tell people you get about one cubic foot of meat, um and it's a forty dollar flat fee so i can sh i i don't i haven't gone crazy with this business but i do have customers who do use it um at thanksgiving it gets pretty popular for people for getting their turkeys because a turkey is about a cubic foot yeah. and a forty dollar delivery fee if they don't want to have to drive to get their turkey from us is pretty convenient i can ship um a lamb in two boxes so an $80 delivery fee for an entire lamb is, is not too bad. Once they get out of that zone, it's not, I can't compete. However, you know, we're trying to build the local regional food system anyhow, so. Right. Well, I'm just thinking when people move away or something and they want your products or they- They do, yeah, they do. That, that. I know that happens with my daughter's uh, business. How about you, Sarah? Do you do any shipping? We do. Uh, the cheese is a little bit easier to ship. Um, we can do two days. I mean, we can keep that cold and uh, for two days. So that gives us a bigger uh, geographic area that we can still service with ground. Um, but we have shipped meat also um, a lot last year during the height of COVID. We were sending a lot of meat out the door. Um, and that has definitely backed off this year, but we are fine with that. Are you also doing dry ice and packaging? Um, we don't usually need the dry ice for the cheese. The ice packs are uh, sufficient, um, but we did dry ice when we're shipping frozen meat, yes. Great, well, I have run through all my pricing questions. Let's see what it says here on the chat. Lauren, do you wanna read the next chat question? 
I think there's one about opening a farm store. Sure. Um, yeah, Corey wants to know what kind of hurdles are there for opening an on on farm store? So like zoning, you need to get permission. Is it is it inspected? Permits. Permits, yeah, all those good things. Here, Sarah, you go first. I'll call on somebody. That way we won't be trying to all talk at once. I think it varies somewhat by county um, as far as zoning and required permits. Um, in our case, what we have had up to this point is has been considered a farm stand. Um, we're not selling any products that are not our own. Um, so we're not selling like products from another farm. Um, and so that eliminated some of the inspection hurdles. Um, I know um, having a, a full-fledged store front where you're selling other people's products does uh, require inspection from Egg and Markets and or um, if you have another, like we'll have a, a milk safety license. So that will kind of supersede the, uh, the storefront yeah. inspection. We'll also have a 20C license in the facility. So that the two of them together, like that is, Egg Markets is already going to be there inspecting. So you don't have somebody coming in and looking at all your retail cuts and going, making sure they're USDA cuts and that sort of thing? Um, I actually just reached out to our inspector about adding the meat um, today. And so I'm waiting for a response back from him as far huh? as how they're going to handle that. Sean, how about you? You said your, was your farm store sounds like it's not at your farm or it is at your farm? Uh, it is. I mean, it's um, my house is at, at, at the farm. So it's, it's yeah, it's at the farm. Um, it's just a small, uh, like a prefab building. Um, I know price was a big hurdle you know getting into it versus just going to the farmer's market um but we found it you know definitely paid off uh you know we can just walk out the door and walk over to the store and meet somebody that stops by to get something um and in our area the like permits and stuff um our area isn't, isn't too strict for that kind of thing so and and we sell pretty much just our own meat which of course has to be usda stamped um to be able to sell by the cut but um yeah it's it wasn't too bad for us so the initial cost of of putting it up um was the biggest hurdle do, do you have um alarms on your freezers in case the temperature drops uh no we don't actually um i mean we're i'm out there pretty much every day checking on things anyways and they're chest freezers that we keep most of the stuff in. So, um, you know, if one were to go out, then, you know, it keeps cold for a few days anyways. Yeah. This time of year, especially. Yeah. Yeah. How about you, Shannon, on your farm store? You also have like a cafe, which is kind of crazy. Yeah. So um, before we used to have, um, we used to just convert our living room when we were starting out at my mom's and dad's house, we would just convert the living room and kitchen into a retail area. Um, and so there wasn't any inspection or anything, but uh, as Sean said, you know, you have to have all these stamps and everything to just do that. So we didn't have any inspections going on for that. When I decided to open the cafe, obviously, then I had a 20C. And so I have an inspector out there all the time covering things. As far as freezer alarms. So yes, I, yes, I have an inspector for the store now. Um, as far as alarms, you asked about alarms. We do have a little um, remote alarm that talks to the internet. And uh, because the store is not where I live and we get a notification if a temperature goes out of zone, so we know. And we, um, so yeah, so we can monitor to make sure that things are staying where they need to be since we are not in the shop at all times. You can have a lot of uh, dollars and cents stashed away in that freezer that I <laughs> want to have spoiled. Um, yeah, well, we we don't have, you know, most of the product is on farm. 
and then we just have a limited amount of product in the store at one time that's yeah good idea um as somebody asked if you what your form of your business was are you an llc and if so what are the pros and cons this isn't exactly a pricing question and if you don't want to answer this you don't have to but i think a lot of people when they start to do some of these businesses are curious about the different types of business setups uh sean or do you are you interested in answering this uh sure um youngman farms is an llc um which basically separates the business from yourself if uh, you know, you were to get sued for whatever, um, you know, the business is liable, not the person. Um, but, uh, we, we operate a little bit differently because my dad owns some of the animals. I own some of the animals. Um, so it's, um, my own customers and everything. I, I, so I guess sort of operate as a sole proprietorship. Um, but the farm as a whole is an LLC. How about you, Sarah? We have not been up to this point um, because everything uh, was, as far as the livestock has been in my name personally, um, I would have been a single member LLC and our attorney has advised that separation um, in a single, between a single member LLC versus um, just having a sole proprietorship that the, the single member LLC is not as protective. Like it's very hard to show that there's actual separation between the LLC entity and the individual. So it, there's not as much value in having one. Um, but we're going to create one, um, now that we'll have the on-farm store, uh, especially because we'll have more traffic on the farm, um, and more risk um, we want to protect ourselves from. I was just thinking about that. When you have people coming on and off the farm, does that raise your insurance liability and that sort of thing? Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Shannon, how about you? You have a lot of family members involved. Yeah. So um, when mom and dad started the farm and I was just a wee tyke, it was just, you know, a sole proprietor kind of situation. Um, they were joint owners, uh, not sole proprietors. Mm -hmm. And the way we worked our way into the farm is Bob and I did not um, go in directly. We built um, separate businesses um, so that we built our own capital and equity. And we built them all up together like that. Um, so I was sole proprietor here um because and bob didn't own it because what we figured out was if i was a sole proprietor and i hired bob as my employee um then he uh could i could give him health insurance benefits for him and his dependents so he was my employee i was his dependent and that way all of our medical expenses were written out of the business which then took our income way down so that enabled us to qualify for more affordable health care so i was the sole proprietor bob was the employee and over here mom and dad were joint owners because they had insurance from former jobs then we all came together and we formed an llc and it became very important to sort of create that separate entity so we all own our separate real estate but this business is its own unique thing that we hold separately however in that i continued to hold on to certain parts of the business um i'm a writer um i have some real estate i held that separately um and it's not in the llc so that i can continue to be a sole proprietor that continues to provide for our health plan that way okay. and yeah that that takes our medical expenses way down oh. it's a good trick we haven't even we haven't talked about that um go ahead um there's a question in the chat from barbara uh is 20 percent typically the difference between wholesale and retail pricing or is there a formula that folks use to figure it out 
or figure the difference. Sean? Uh, <clears throat> I think 20% is, is probably pretty typical. Um, I mean, it can probably vary based on an, an agreement you might have with um, wherever you're selling, but uh, yeah, I think that's usual 15 to 20%, maybe 30% um, sometimes, but. So I'm thinking you're, you're not making as much on the wholesale meat that you sell, but you can sell more volume easily that way. Right. We're moving more. Right. And, and for us, it works because it's just dad and I, um, winter time isn't too bad, but come spring, summer and fall, it's, it's hard to keep up with just everyday chores on the farm. Um, and, um, yeah, that's why we kind of went with a wholesale. Yeah. We make less prey animal, but, um, we're able to move more that way. Mm -hmm. How about you, Sarah? Do you think is 20% typical of your wholesale? Um, we use probably 25% for the dairy products and that's just an arbitrary number. And I think you can adjust that. <clears throat> I mean, you need to look at the amount of time you're saving um, and marketing costs that you're saving and how much volume you're moving and figure out a number that works for you. And it doesn't have to be a set percentage just because somebody said it should be, you know, um, if you're in a situation where you have surplus product that you need to move and you would rather, um, like for us going forward, we're going to have excess milk capacity initially. Um, so if we can move that product and at least cover our operating costs, uh, it's going to make sense for us to to get that out the door rather than not selling that product. Um, and kind of in on the other extreme, when it comes to our meat, some of our cuts that are always in high demand, we don't discount that wholesale price on those products at all. If somebody wants to buy that wholesale, they're gonna pay the same retail, retail price. price because we don't have an excess of it. Uh, and we don't care if we sell it wholesale or not. So it's, you you can be flexible to fit your situation. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Shannon, how about you? Um, pretty much what Sarah said. I do 20% uh, if it's a business to business arrangement as, as a courtesy. Um, but if I'm stuck with some cuts and I need to move them, then that price goes down. And um, I'll never sell steaks wholesale. <laughs> Right. They're just, they're too hard to come by. They're too easy to sell. And, and there's, there's just no reason again, and pork shoulders either. I'm just not motivated. They're too delicious. Uh, I'm just curious. There's another good question from Lauren, but I'm curious what your most popular product is. Each of you, Sean. Um, well, we've kind of with the, with the individual cuts anyways, we've kind of trained our customers a little bit on the the lesser known cuts like the denver steaks and the the chuck eyes and flat irons and tri-tip and and i would say that the flat iron the tri-tip um well there's only two on a cow so you know they're not many anyways but and then of course uh you know your rib eyes and t-bones strip steaks um yeah and of course time of year you know, matters to around Christmas time. Everybody wants a prime rib. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I was curious because I was charging a lot for lamb chops and decreasing my price on like ground lamb. And it turns out people really wanted ground lamb. And I, I could actually increase that a little, a little more than I thought and charge a little less for things like shoulder steaks. Same thing to get people to try them. And, and uh, then, the, then they like those too, luckily. Um, Shannon, how about you? What's your most popular product? Uh, well, I could go pull up my annual statement that I just finished doing and tell <laughs> you who's getting the most sales. But um, uh, one thing that we do that's a specialty is sausages. I've developed recipes for some specialty artisan sausages. Mm -hmm. um, so sausages, just easy. People can't wreck it. And um, so we move a lot of that. 
um, lamb. Um, we do a lot of lamb shares um, where people buy their whole lambs cut up. Um, and the chickens, obviously, you know, again, it's easy. It's hard to wreck them. <laughs> so it, it's hard. But honestly, since I opened a cafe, I just can't believe how many people just want me to cook it for them. And um, <laughs> I'm, I'm kind of agog mm-hmm. at that because, you know, if you want to talk about pricing, the margin, the return to, to the farm on, on meat um, is often, you know, less than 10%. But you make a sticky bun and you fill it with sugar and you have a 300 or 400 percent markup or a cup of coffee is like 300 (laughs) percent markup. And people come in and they drop their money for their sticky bun and they drop their money for that cup of coffee. And then they tell you that your chickens are too expensive. And it's like, <laughs> you have no idea what's expensive here and what's not expensive here. It's amazing. So yeah, a lot of people, they they complain about a dozen eggs that might cost $5, but they'll pay me $15 to, to fry two of them. <laughs> you know, I don't, I don't get it. There you go. That, that's interesting. Sarah, how about you? Do you... Uh... Uh, do you have a specialty product or uh, something that's super popular with your, your, uh, buyers? Um, our longer age cheeses are definitely high demand because we, we also have them in lesser volume. So that's our, our kind of our, our limiting factor. Um, and then going forward, we'll have the opportunity to increase our production there somewhat um Mm -hmm. but otherwise it's bacon always bacon (laughs) that's that if we could make well we actually we do make more of the pig into bacon we make as much of the pig into bacon as we can (laughs) now um and uh we make all of our round into jerky uh so we don't even we we never have brown steak to sell i mean i've never had one cut so that has been a big hit for us that's interesting. Good idea. Value added. So Lauren, I see you've got another question. Would you like to ask that? Sure. Um, I, we just, maybe we just touched on it a little bit, but comments about your prices from customers. And, and if you do, how do you, how do you manage that? How do you, uh, especially negative someone? comments? Yes. Yeah. How do you talk with them about it? Yeah, uh, definitely get get that every once in a while. Um, but most your average consumer doesn't really understand what goes into you know raising an animal, um, whether it's a cow or a chicken uh, or a pig, um, and you just kind of explain to them, <clears throat> you know, the process from from birth to the butcher shop and. Um, you know, maybe the, the costs that go into actually cutting up the animal, um, the packaging and all that good stuff. Um, and usually they, they come around, but there, there are some people that, you know, saw the ground beef on sale at their local grocery store and thinks your ground beef should cost the same. And, and, uh, those, you know, those customers, well, they're not going to be customers, but, um, you just try to educate as much as you can. Um, you know, most people didn't grow up on a farm. So these days, it's true. true. Sarah, how about you? Do you ever have people complain? (laughs) Um, sometimes, I mean, sometimes you can just see the look on someone's face and they may not actually say anything. (laughs) Um, very rarely have we actually had somebody make a comment. Um, and it's, I think as a farmer, we understand that. I mean, I'm sometimes shocked when I go to the grocery store and look at prices on things. And it, it sort of is hard to fathom for me that, you know, I, because we always have product in our fridge and our freezer that we grew, you don't think about the cash outlay. Um, anyway, it seems like a lot of cash for us sometimes. Um, so I, I can understand where people are coming from. And I think it's education is what it comes down to. I mean, most people, if they don't understand 
the amount of costs and also effort and labor that goes into the products, they, you know, we are in the US uh, fortunate to have a cheap food supply and people are just accustomed to it. And so education is just important. Yeah, we're very spoiled. Shannon, do you have any other comments on that? Uh, touched on that in your last talk too. Yeah, at the farmer's market, I face this a lot. When you're in a high retail setting, um, it was. And uh, Bob had a brilliant trick. Some people would come up, they'd be really grouchy. And they, your ground lamb is too expensive. And um, Bobby, I don't know if you, for those of you who know Bobby, he's like this big tall guy with these soft brown eyes. And he would look at them earnestly and he'd say, you know, I think that other farmer down the other way is going to serve you a lot better. I think you'll like their product better. And he'll just send them on. And I thought, he just sent away a customer. And I was ready to know to justify my expenses and everything. And what we started to figure out was, um, and, and, and bacon, what I started to discover at our farmer's market with bacon was that um, there was a phenomenon where the people who bought bacon always complained about the price. And they complained about just about everything. And so I stopped carrying <laughs> bacon and started referring all of my customers to this other farmer who would carry bacon and she's like oh this is great shannon's shannon's sending me all this business and i'm like no i'm not i'm sending you my bacon so because those people would buy bacon and then they wouldn't buy any of my other meat i wanted to deal with the meat customers so yes people always complained always complained and what bob taught me was that um send them to someone else if they need to complain you will not be successful at anything in life without incurring judgment you just won't be. So you have to just decide whether any of that judgment that's going to happen is worth listening to or not worth listening to and, and move forward. So I save them up. I write stories about them. Um, <laughs> and I've had people who really, they just need to make themselves feel better by putting me down for what I'm asking. I've been accused of being elitist. I've been accused of being a sellout because um, I made a slick website. I mean, all kinds of things uh, people just do. It's what they have to do. If they're not feeling good where they are in their lives, then they have to do it. And some people really don't understand the food system. And if they're really earnest, then they kind of ask a question that teaches you that they want to be told. So they're not gonna say your prices are too high. They're not gonna say you don't deserve it. They're gonna say, why is the price different? And so I'm not going to waste my time anymore. I've been in this business for so many years. Sapwich Hollow is over 40 years old now. I am not going to waste my time educating a customer any longer who just wants to put me down for where I'm at in my life. I'm going to send them to another business as swiftly as possible <laughs> and, and, and cut because the, remember I talked about when the pricing earlier, when I said how much handling of the product and how much marketing is required. If that person just wants to put me down, I, I don't need to waste my time on them, but they will frame their question in such a way that lets me know they want the education. Why is this price difference? The question of why the earnestness in the body language that says, yeah, we're going to have a conversation about education. But other than that, no, no, I'm at a point in my life where I'm not doing that anymore. And I don't need to beg them for that business. That's good because any retail situation can be like that. Any retail shop, not just food, it can be very frustrating sometimes trying to make everybody happy, but you can't do it. Um, we have, I, we're, we should wrap up pretty soon. We've been on Zoom a long time, folks, and, and uh, our panelists have been very patient about answering a lot of questions. But uh, Corey's asking, what are some examples of your prices? If you're willing to share uh, some examples of what you charge for say hamburger or Something. Else. Yeah, but Shannon just said you can see them at their uh, website, and that's also true of Sean, and probably also true of Sarah. So you can look those up afterwards, and uh, that might be the easiest way to do it. Um, and uh, you know, the local foods group here is willing to help people that want to talk about stuff like that too, and web pages and social media and all those good things. So. I, th I think still has prices listed for all ah, the products yes. that are listed on their, their website. So that, that's, that's a, a good place to go 
Right. Yeah, I'm going to send that hurt. out in the uh, follow up. The meatsweet.com yeah. is sweet, like S U I T E. Yeah. That's at least yeah. for like the hanging weight price. They don't have individual, or at least I don't think so. Um, yeah. I think but, that's like a custom. Yeah. Yeah. But that's okay. It gives you a place to see what other people are charging for those kind of things, also. So that's great. I do. I look there myself quite frequently just to see what how prices are doing. Yeah what people are charging uh, some do of them even, might not be updated you know right recently, but yeah. do do are you, any of you use any of other website like that that helps people search for your find your farm like meat sweet or i know the ag and markets has a website where you can go and put in your farm and people can search within 50 miles of their house or something too yeah there's there's a few different um there's uh i can't remember what it's called now northeast beef uh something i don't remember what it's called mm -hmm. now but well we're listed on that local harvest i think is another one mm -hmm. um we have something in our area called adirondack harvest for example okay. where you can be on the map we have a local foods map ourselves in our county so those are kind of good if you're looking for customers and need to get the word out Barbara is asking if you're using Meat Sweet now. Anybody using Meat Sweet? We yeah, do. We're, yes. we're on it. Okay, great. Well, I'd like to thank the panelists for spending a, an hour and a half here tonight and this uh, winter evening with us. I appreciate your taking the time and being your willingness to share the information with people is really helpful. Um, we had about 20 people on and we have 60 signed up to get the recording. So hey, your, your wisdom will be spread far and wide here. And Good I hope I get everybody. Thank you. And I hope, I hope I get to visit you guys once in a while. I visit Western New York, at least in the uh, summertime. So maybe I can get out that way and see a couple of you anyways. So thank you very much for joining us. And thank you to the people online and the webinar. And we will be sending you a copy of the recording and a bunch of the references we've talked about. And uh, thank you, Lauren, for co-hosting. And uh, have a great night, everybody. I was going to say drive safe, but we're all at home already. So that's the good news. Yeah. Thank you, panelists. Take care, everybody. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Thanks, Betsy, too, for moderating. You're welcome. I enjoyed it. I'm just holding out in case there's more questions. <laughs> You're getting lots of thank yous. Great. Have a great night. <laughs>